A very good afternoon and salam sejahtera to everyone. I'm Vimala from MPC, will be the moderator for the session today. So let's kick off the session now with a brief introduction of today's event. So currently I can see already 41 attendees online and I can see more and more participants are coming in uh, to join our session today. Great. Welcome to GRP webinar series on the topic of understanding public consultation in Malaysia part one hosted by MPC. This GRP webinar series is a platform where we bring experts to share information and best practices regarding good regulatory practices. As we are aware, public consultation is a core element in the development and implementation of good regulations. With that, today's topic, understanding public consultation in Malaysia, will cover key principles and various elements on how to conduct effective public consultation. Uh, let me introduce our speaker for today, Mr. Mama Hiza'a, Mama Izam. is a partner in the Corporate and Government Advisory Practice Group at Zahid Ibrahim & Co, a member of Zico Law. His practice focuses in the area of law reform. This includes advising federal and state government, including ministries, regulators, statutory body on the on the end-to-end -end law reform. At the same time, his practice includes providing strategy and legal support to private sector clients interested in engaging the government in a policy development and reform. Last but not least, Mr. Izaa also a co-lead of Zico Labs, Zico Laws Regional Corporate Social Responsibility CSR initiative to assist the startup and a scale-up ecosystem. He has worked with the local and international intermediaries in addition to government agency to support and provide legal assistance to emerging entities. So there is a little background about our speaker for today. So before we start the session, just a quick reminder to all the participants. Firstly, on the question. So during the webinar, participants are invited to send questions either in Bahasa or English through the question box. So please, if you have any question and clarification, send to to the question box which you can see on the right side of your screen. The speaker at the end of the presentation will address some of the questions received, but no worries. We will compile all the questions and we will provide written answer through email to all the participants in a couple of days after the session. And secondly, on the slide presentation can be downloaded at the end out box. You can see on your right side at your screen as well. So without further ado, I would like to invite our distinguished speaker for today. Mr. Izaha to start sharing the session. Mr. Izaha, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Vimala. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Vimala has introduced, my name is Izaha and I am from Zico. Uh, I would first like to say thank you so much for taking your time on a Friday afternoon to join us for this session. And I hope you're all doing well uh, staying at home right now. So as you can see, my topic that I'm going to talk about is understanding public consultation. Let's go to the next slide, please. One more slide. Thank you. So let me give you some perspective before we actually go into the details of what public consultation is about. Um, I'd like to walk you through this uh, very a uh, recent uh, case study that we see. Uh, I don't want to politicize this issue. I mean, we don't want to talk about who's at fault or who didn't make the right decisions, but let's just talk about it from a public consultation perspective. So as everyone knows, uh, during the recent MCO, all businesses that were not deemed as uh, essential services essentially could not op operate. But uh, on 10 April, as we know, there was a move to, to create a new list which allowed certain industries to operate and one of which uh, included uh, the operation of barbershops. So, you know, for us to cut our hair. So I think from, from a, an idea, it sounds good. I mean, people have been in lockdown for some time. Our hair's going out of control. You know, we want to look good for our significant others. And from an industry perspective, I'm sure barbershops are people who need disposable income. So these people need money as well. So it sounds like a win-win angle from a supply and demand perspective. But the, the very next day, if you look at the second article on 11th April, uh, a lot of industry associations, a lot of barbershop associations came out and said that, look, it's not a good idea. I don't know how we are going to do it. And at the end of the day, we don't want to risk spreading the virus over the fact that whether our company or business will survive. So they, they realized that, look, it's, it's not going to work and we can't do it. 
And the following uh, Monday, I think a few days later, on the 13th of April, what happens next is that the government decides, look, and I like this quote, the government, as you can see, we've underlined, has listened to the views of the people. So I just want you to, to step back and think about it. In this scenario, um, where do you think the stakeholder engagement happened? Or who, who do you think are the relevant stakeholders that need to be consulted? Because there's so many different perspectives involved here. First, we have the government's perspective in terms of the decision-making process and coming up with the policy. How did they come up with the idea to actually allow these people to open? How did someone say, oh, look, that's a good idea, you know? Who did they speak to? And when they want to implement that idea from a hygiene perspective, how are they going to do it? I know if you read the article, they actually say that haircuts only, no washing. But what about social distancing? What about sanitizing and so on? From an industry perspective, I think everyone knows the fundamental question is, were they consulted beforehand? Judging from the reaction, it doesn't seem likely. And also, what would be the likely cost involved if they were to open? Because I assume that they would have SOPs in terms of social distancing, sanitizing, cleaning the equipment, and so on. So if you do a simple cost benefit analysis, you would realize that the cost of operating may be, may be even more than the cost of shutting down. And the last question is from a consumer perspective. Would, would you go to these shops? Would, would any sensible person go to, to cut their hair at this point in time? And I think the answer most people say is no. Because if you think about it, any cost that the business incurs would pass down and flow back to the consumer. So the consumer would have to cover the cost of hygiene, sanitation, sanitization, deep cleaning, and so on. So any cost would basically just pass through to the consumers. So I think this sets the stage very well in terms of what we want to talk about in terms of the ideas and the concepts of public consultation. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so this is the, the outline that uh, we have prepared. And I, I think we've made it quite easy to understand because it's an introduction to public consultation. What we want to cover is the five W's and the one H, which is what is public consultation? Where are the requirements? Why is it important? Who's involved? When to consult? And how should it be conducted? And as you can see at the bottom there, I think in the, in the spirit of public consultation, we are letting you choose the topics for next week. So you can see at the bottom, there's a slider code and you can scan the slider code. The slider code actually allows you to go to a slider poll and the slider poll will have certain pre-selected topics where you can actually vote on the topics of choice for next week. So please do check it out. Uh, the highest votes win. Uh, don't worry. I think uh, the QR code will appear again at the end of the slide. And also, you will be given a copy of the slide, so you can also scan it at your own time later on. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Now, the question is that we first need to address or talk about is what is public consultation? I think as a starting point, of course, we have to define uh, the features of public consultation. If you look at the definition given under MPC's guideline on public consultation procedures, you can see that consultation is a two-way process for the government to seek and receive the views of businesses and the general public on changes in policy or regulation that affects them directly or in which they may have a significant interest. So there are a lot of definitions out there. You can Google definitions by OECD, by World Bank, um, literal definitions, but I think they cover essentially the same themes. And if you look at the key themes, the first one is that it is a process. Uh, the, the, the definition given under the MPC public consultation guideline actually says that it is a two-way process. I, I want you to remember this because at certain points at, or sometimes in the public consultation process, it's not two-way, it can be one way, and we will look into that later. The second one is to obtain input. I think this is also a very fundamental theme because um, when you engage, you want to obtain issues, you want to obtain opinions, you want to obtain solutions, you want to get ideas. So depending on the uh, information that you want to ob obtain, the method of your engagement will also differ. And that is also another thing we will look at later. And the last point is definitely from stakeholders. So if you, if you look at the definition uh, under the consultation handbook, it actually says affected directly or has interest. Has interest may be someone who is not affected directly. So that is why stakeholder identification or stakeholder mapping is very important because there are a lot of stakeholders involved 
and sometimes it may not be obvious in terms of identifying interested parties in the process. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Next slide, please. So where are the requirements? Um, if we look at the, the requirements under law, I just want to cover this very briefly. I, I think um, there are countries that have legislation which require you to do public consultation before you create law or policy. I think a good example is in Sweden. I think uh, just to, to mention very briefly, they have an instrument of government in 1974, which basically says that in deciding government business, which is basically in making any decisions by the government, the private person needs to be needs to be uh, consulted or needs to have an opportunity to express their opinion. And the Ministry of Justice in their country will ensure that this is done. And similarly, I think in the US also, they have a federal law in 1946, which requires a notice of proposed rulemaking uh, in the federal registrar when you have a regulatory proposal. And therefore, you need to consult with the public to ensure that the public knows, among others, how the law is to be implemented and rolled out at a later stage. So there are already um, countries that have this legislation. I think on the international scene, we have the OECD and the World Bank for some standards. Uh, the OECD has a background document on public consultation, and they have already collaborated with MPC in developing the RIA and also the RIA public consultation guide. In terms of the World Bank, the World Bank has given technical assistance uh, to many countries in developing a unified public consultation platform. Malaysia is one. Uh, we have one that was co-developed by the World Bank in, in 2018 with MPC, and I'll talk about that later. Next slide, please. Now, the requirements under uh, Malaysian law is quite clear. There's no omnibus or all-encompassing law that requires us to conduct public consultation. We don't have a federal legislation to that effect. But what we have is the, the circular, as mentioned by Dato' Ui last week. We have the circular number one of 2013, which mandates the NPDR and also comes up with the RIA process. And part and parcel of the RIA process is conducting public consultation. I would think that this is one of the most fundamental aspects of the RIA, probably only second to the cost-benefit analysis process. And when you read this requirement or this uh, uh, aspect of RIA, you need to read it together with the circular number one of 2012, which actually mandates conducting online public consultation uh, for the government regulators. But bear in mind that this um, circular has actually lapsed in 2014, but it's still useful in terms of a re reference point in identifying using online tools as well as online best practices in engaging um, stakeholders. And also another, another um, important reference material would be the Best the guideline on public consultation procedures. I think the presentation today is largely based on this guideline. So a lot of the content that we will discuss today is actually will actually be reflected in the slides. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, the next slide is actually the importance of public consultation. When uh, do we have or when do we do public consultation? So I think um, I want to use a contemporary example. If you read in the papers every day, everyone is talking about having a COVID law, COVID legislation. We've seen countries doing it. Why not Malaysia, right? And everyone is talking about legal shield, legal shield, legal shield. So if you look at the image on the top left, I just want to I just want to show you how many stakeholders are involved in this process. Of course, this is not exhaustive, but this is just an idea just to give you an idea in terms of the pain points in developing the policy or the legislation. Because we not only have vertical stakeholders, which is the government and the general public, but we also have horizontal uh, stakeholders such as the regulators and the industry. And everyone here has opposing uh, forces or concerns or, or, or uh, interests. So this will all keep pushing on the process and may not be the same. So let me ask you the most basic of question. I know you can't answer me, but the most basic of question is when you want to develop this legislation, what do you want to put in the act, right? That's that's what everyone want to know. What 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 would go into this act? So this answer would definitely depend on who you ask, you know. And I like this cartoon on the right. Um, interestingly, I found it on PDRM's Facebook page. 
I don't know why they uploaded it, but it's it's quite interesting. And it shows that we are not all in the same boat, but we are all in the same storm. So the same storm, I mean, this is in relation to COVID, of course, but we are not all in the same boat. This is a very good point. There's a lot of different factors or externalities that affect us, and therefore there are different interests that we have. As you can see, there's a big boat, there's a small boat, there's a yacht, and so on. So everyone has, has different interests in that sense. So if you ask the government in terms of what they want to have or what they want to put in the law, they would want to have something that's generally beneficial for the greater rakyat, for, you know, to, to fight the virus, to make sure economies can survive, to make sure economies can revive. If you ask industries, they want to make sure that they don't go bankrupt. You know, they want to protect their businesses, look at their contracts, look at their funding, look at their employment issues. Um, if you ask the regulators, they would be more concerned about regulatory delivery. How do we implement this? How do we roll it out? If you remember during, I think, the second phase of uh, MCO, there was a, a, a time when they allowed people to travel interstate and they said, look, you can do that, but you need to get PDRM's approval. And very quickly that night, I think everyone here would have seen that there were many photos uh, circulating about people traveling, about people going, wanting to travel and then going to the police station. And then basically the police station was inundated with so many people, you know, backlog, people queuing just to get their approval. And then what happened the very next day, the government said, look, you don't need to get approval anymore because the institutions or the implementing agencies were not ready to do that. And if you ask the public, what are their concerns? Financial commitments, access, survivability, and so on. So yes, there are common threats that overlap in terms of, um, of these issues, but public consultation is important because if you want to achieve the best possible outcome, you need to have the right issues and you need to have the best solutions to consider. And if you don't have that information, you can't come up with a holistic solution. So that's what I, I'm trying to say here. I think that's the key message. Next slide. Now, um, okay, if you look at uh, these, these are also very central themes to why public consultation is important, um, instilling accountability to the government, the rulemaking process, boosting public confidence in the government in the, in, during the rulemaking process, improving awareness and understanding, encouraging public ownership and commitment, uh, promoting transparency and accountability. So before I talk about these things, what if you look at the top right, we actually have what I'm going to put throughout the slide deck, which actually allows you to vote for next week's subtopics. And these are questions that I put which could be of interest to you. So for example, you may want to know uh, more about these themes, and I can actually go into more detail in, ter in terms of a case study for each criteria in relation to the to the importance of public consultation, if this is something you want to know. So for example, if you want to talk about um, instilling public consultation, instilling, uh, um, instilling public confidence in the public consultation process, something that we can talk about is the concept of engagement fatigue. So if you, you, know, if you engage someone too often, um, you know, they may not want to speak to you, or if you engage them too often and then you, re and you ask them, why don't you want to speak to me? You realize because They've been engaged so many times on this topic. You know, I've, I've seen this a lot in the past when you speak to them and they say, uh, you are not the first one. You are orang ke seratus. I dah hantar surat kat KSU. I dah hantar surat kat Menteri Lama. I dah hantar surat kat Menteri Baru. So if I want to talk to you, what's the point? There's no point. So there's a lot of these considerations that we can also share if you're interested. So just do vote on this if you're interested to learn more about this. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, now this is in uh, relation to the stakeholder uh, analysis or stakeholder identification. So when, when we talk about uh, who is involved, of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of stakeholders, right? So not only the horizontal and vertical, the ones those I just put into uh, easy groups to understand, but they're just too many to name. Even if we take a, a single company as an example, uh, as, an, as a company, as an entity, it could just be one company, or it could be a group of companies, or it could be an association of companies, it could be an NGO, uh, it could be academicians that are interested in a particular area that a company or business is operating, it could be a professional body. So this, the, the list goes on and on, it's, it's extensive. So the concept of stakeholder identification here is two parts. 
Firstly, there's a stakeholder analysis, which is what this slide talks about. And there's stakeholder mapping, which is what the next slide talks about. So when we talk about stakeholder analysis, it's actually, it's actually quite simple. Um, what you do or what you're encouraged to do if you look at the guidelines is to come up with an exhaustive list of all the stakeholders that you think would be interested in your issue. So you come up with that laundry list and just you know, prepare that list. And secondly, what you really need to consider or what you really need to do then is to define the criteria. So there will be a, a, what we call an influence and an importance matrix. Influence would be on the y-axis and importance would be on the x-axis. It's up to you to define what you mean by influence in this sense because that is your issue. So when you say influence, for example, you may want to say that how much influence that stakeholder has in determining the outcome of the decision. That could be one definition that you would want to adopt. And if you talk about importance, you may want to define the importance of a stakeholder as how that particular stakeholder is to the decision making process. So how important is that particular stakeholder? So once you have these two parameters, what you must then do is rate these companies. So perhaps you can use a scale of one to 10, scale of one to five. Two very simple examples um, I can give you. Company A and company B are two tour operators that want to, that want to be engaged for amendments to tourism legislation. Company A is a small startup with one year experience and company B is a GLC with 30 years experience and international offices. So now it can, it can be argued that in terms of the importance of these companies, they are the same. Both of these companies are in the tourism industry. They will be directly affected by the tourism law. So you may want to rate them highly. But if you talk about the influence, company A may be less influential compared to company B because company A is a small company, does not have the experience. Company B has been in this industry a long, in a long time and is also a government-linked company. So it's, it's also involved somewhat in that decision-making process. So these are just some ideas in terms of ranking these companies from you know, one to 10 in terms of importance and influence. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Okay, so the next part of uh, stakeholder identification is stakeholder mapping. You would see this in the guideline on public consultation procedures also, I think page 21, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, what you can see is the influence against important matrix. Now, what you do after you have ranked your stakeholders if you, is you have to plot them on this matrix. And once you plot them, I'm sure you'll see a very interesting matrix if you actually carry out this exercise and, and think about it properly, you'll see your stakeholders all across the board. Um, I just want to talk quickly on the results. So if you look at the results, what does the A, B, C, D box means? So the, the A box are the, are the people who are you know, high importance and obviously high influence. Uh, these are the people that you would need to manage closely and perhaps you have a high degree of involvement throughout your decision making or your consultation process. So these are people that you need to keep close to you throughout the whole time. Uh, B, these people are high in importance, but they are low in uh, influence. So that could be the company, like I mentioned earlier, the, the company A, that they, even though it is their industry, but they don't have the same leverage or, or, or uh, political power or will as per the previous company. So for these people, you need to keep them informed and you need to anticipate their needs throughout the uh, stakeholder engagement process. Uh, on the opposite side of that, we also have the Group C stakeholders. So these are people who are, you know, uh, less influential in the, in their, sorry, they are less important in the process, but they are very influential. They are high in terms of their influence. And you need to, you need to ensure that these people, um, you keep them satisfied throughout the process. And the last one would be the Group D, which is the people who are less influential and also less important. So these people, you know, you, these are the people that you typically, you don't have to pay so much attention to them. You just have to monitor them. So when you, when you plot your stakeholders, you have an idea in terms of where these, these organizations lie. Now, you may be asking, you know, what, what is a, a typical scenario, you know, in terms of, let's say, when we come up with a, a particular legislation, where would stakeholders be? I don't want to, to give you a definitive answer because it would vary depending on what you're engaging on and what you want to achieve. But I just want to, I just want to give you an illustration, an illustration just to give you an idea. So for example, let's say we want to come up again with a tourism law. 
uh, tourism operators, tourism implementing agencies, MOTEC, you know, they would definitely be in category A because these people are very important. And I'm just generalizing here. So they would be in A. Uh, B, perhaps the, the smaller companies that I mentioned, the ones that are not, you know, part of associations, the one who are uh, just starting out in this industry, but, you know, they would be affected by the regulations and they would like to know those may be in the B group. So they're important, but they're not as influential as the guys in A. And then we have the C group, who would be someone that is uh, very influential in this process, but um, would not have so much importance in terms of determining the outcome of the law. Perhaps one, one group of people that we can talk about is the other ministries, because maybe we're talking about tourism law, but at the end of the day, when you want to get uh, you know, approval in parliament, you need to bring a cabinet paper, you need to conduct your MJM. So be before you, you reach that stage, you want to engage these people. So, you know, MOF might be important to engage and all the other ministries because you want them to get buy-in in terms of what you are doing instead of just presenting it at the 11th hour. So these people may be influential stakeholders, but they, they may not really be concerned about the content of the law per se. And the last one, D, who, who's the group that is, you know, the least affected or the least concerned? I mean, typically people would argue the general public, but, you know, if, if we're talking about tourism law, if there's cost implication to the general public, they may be uh, more important and more influential depending you know, on whether they go into NGOs or whether they go into associations, they could actually have a bigger voice. So these are things that you need to think about when you do your stakeholder mapping. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, an example of a stakeholder mapping that I've done in the past. Actually, this is a revised one, uh, I couldn't, uh, pull up very quickly the, the messy one I don't remember what it is but I want what I wanted to show you is it can be very messy if you do it properly and if you want to know why you can vote on it and I'll tell you next week but but if you do if you are interested to talk about this we can actually talk about the step-by-step -step mapping process and we can show you how it's done but okay I'll just tell you very quickly why it's not messy here is because we decide to group certain categories of people so instead of having the companies uh, in A, B, C, D, we realized there was a common theme or common trend that certain companies could be moved into A, for example. So we, we clustered them there. There were very few companies that were in C or B, but, you know, for the purposes of engaging, and you will realize this later as to why we did that, um, it's more efficient. And, um, yeah, so we will talk about uh, the engagement strategies in, in the next slides. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now the, the burning question, uh, I guess, is when do you consult? Um, I think uh, if you look at the public consultation procedures guide, it says as early as possible. And I think the most important uh, feature of that is as early as possible to influence the outcome. So, you know, you need to come in before the decision has to be made. If you look at the, the middle there, yes, there is the formal consultation process that we, of course, have to do. But if you're talking about throughout the whole uh, law reform process or decision-making process, it can be any time. So, for example, um, if a regulator wants to come up with a law, you know, even before they start thinking about what will be in the law or whether they're going to do it, they're going to do a feasibility study. They're going to do a green paper. They're going to do a concept paper. So they have to go down, talk to the industry, find out the issues. I like to talk about uh, vape legislation because I remember very fondly in 2015, people were all saying vape, 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 vape law, but until today, there's no vape law, okay? Because that was something that people thought was an issue. It came up very quickly and it also died very quickly. So was there an actual issue to, to legislate on this? Or if you think about it, if you did, or if we did come up with legislation at that point in time, it would have been a very knee-jerk legislation just because there was people saying that we need one, we need one, but do we or did we actually need one? Now, during the, the formal consultation process, you know, when you consult, the, the considerations are different. Um, that is, of course, when you want to get policy or direction or content in terms of the law, what you want to put in your COVID act, so to speak, and whatnot. Um, if you talk about post-consultation, uh, of course, once the legislation is prepared, uh, the government or regulators, you want to talk to in the industry from a different perspective. You want to talk to them about implementation. You want to talk to them about industry de developments, industry best practices. Perhaps something has changed. Perhaps there's time to revisit the law because there has been development. So the, the conversation is continuing uh, throughout the process. 
but the questions differ depending on what stage you are at. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is the formal consultation process that is uh, in the uh, guideline. Now, if you look at this uh, process, it's actually a four-step process. So it starts with the notification and the preparation, which is sort of the, the pre-consultation process. And then you have the consultation itself, and then you have the conclusion. So if you look at the timeline at the bottom, and then I, I, get, I got this from the uh, procedures, it basically says that the whole process is up to 28 weeks. Um, you spend roughly between four to 12 weeks during the notification and the preparation stage. And then you consult formally for about 12 weeks. And then you have your conclusion four weeks to, to wrap up after that. Now, in my experience, there's a lot of work behind the scenes here. Um, I'm not gonna go through the, the content inside this table. I mean, you can read that. But what I want to say as a starting point is you need to prepare the consultation plan. Uh, consultation plan would include that stakeholder mapping that you did earlier, the identification of methods or techniques uh, in terms of how you want to consult people, and also the objective of each consultation session, which we have not talked about. And you also need to prepare the consultation document, which basically outlines information on your consultation, you know, what is the problem when you need to do it, what you intend to achieve. And you need to give this to the stakeholders within a reasonable time. So you can't give it to them last minute and whatnot. And lastly, during the consultation itself, I think a lot of uh, people uh, undermine the importance of properly, properly recording uh, information and feedback. Um, we don't think in terms of what's the best way to record the information. Uh, we, you know, we go in and we just, uh, bring paper and then we write down what's been told over us but it's not in any structured manner and then we you know we always like if there's anything we'll call you later we'll follow up later by the end it's always a loss of data a loss of information when we don't structure it properly and post consultation um, something that's important to consider or talk about is of course the closure report and of course you need to decide very early in terms of whether you will communicate uh, the results of feedback to the stakeholders you know it doesn't have to be done in all cases you know it's up to the regulator to decide, but it should be done. It, it promotes transparency and so on. It should be done. But there are circumstances when it's not practicable or it, you know, it can't be done. But uh, you need to decide very on whether you'll do those things. And um, if you are interested in this area, I've also put a box in this area at the top. Uh, if you want to vote for next week, we can go through a typical consultation session and what happens pre, during and post including preparing the consultation plan, the consultation document, and the closure report. Okay, next slide. Okay, so these are uh, principles of public consultation that you can see in the guideline. Now, if you, if you look at the guideline, they have six uh, principles, and um, I can just read it from top to bottom, transparency, accountability, commitment, include, inclusiveness that is equitable, timely and inform informative, as well as in integrity with mutual respect. So I know you can't answer me uh, right now, but uh, I have a hypothetical scenario, or is it real? I don't know, but anyways, a hypothetical scenario on the left side, um, I'll just read it to you very quickly. So on 7th May, a minister uploaded a link to the ministry's website on his social media account to obtain feedback on issues and recommendations from the businesses affected by COVID-19. Key information, the consultation period is from 4th May 2020 to 11th May 2020, so it's actually still ongoing. Uh, the link to the website was defective, where the URL went to another website, an international website. The actual ministry's website had a form with only five broad questions or open-ended answers, and the notes uh, mentioned in the website that the government has already drafted a plan. So does this comply with the public consultation principles on the right? So, I mean, yeah, you can't answer me, but I'll give you the answer. Things that you should think about. Look at the consultation period. Um, the consultation period started on 4th May, but the minister uploaded his uh, post on 7th May, which was three days into the consultation. So the consultation period has actually been shortened in that sense. In that sense. Um, secondly, it was on his uh, social media account. Is that a good method to promote, uh, uh, you know, feedback on issues relating to public health? 
I mean, I'm sure his friends are on his social media account, but what about the general public? You know, what about everyone else who is affected? Now, the link being effective, of course, I, I like you or anyone else, if I click on the link, it doesn't go to where I want it to go. It's unlikely I'm going to type in the official ministry's website, even though I know which ministry it is. But, you know, I'll be like, uh, there's a word, you know, typical, uh, you know, our typical Malaysian attitude. Of and um, on the form itself, uh, you know, it, and, and I wish I could put it here, but it was not clear in terms of the information or the solutions that were expected. So the, the questions were, were far too broad. The questions were far too vague. And also there was no uh, person in charge to, to clarify if, you know, I didn't know if I want to answer here what's going to happen. Um, another important part of uh, consultation is integrity and confidentiality. You know, you need to make sure that when people give you information, that, that information will be kept confidential. There's no um, communication of that sort. So I don't know what's going to happen to the data. And lastly, the, the narrative, the government has already drafted a plan so if, if it was me and I, you know, I was severely affected, I would, I would not be happy because if the government has already done something, then why would you want to listen to me? It, it may be too late or, or whatever I say, you know, might just be water under the bridge. So it's not going to be taken into account. And I, I think it's very, very important that when you, when you do your engagement session, you get the title right. I think um, in MPC, Vimala, we've seen a session in the past that has gone very badly just because the title was wrong. So if I can share here, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about what session or what it was, but in the title, the title actually said proposing a regulatory framework, but the actual session was to share information in terms of a feasibility study done on the issue. So when you propose a title in that manner and you, and you invite people to come and listen, you say proposed regulatory framework, people who are affected by these issues will come in. And these people, they will not be happy. When they came in, they were loud, they were angry. They said, why were we not consulted? If you're gonna propose legislation in this area, you've not spoken to us. We are important stakeholders. But in actual fact, the session itself was not about a regulatory framework. It was just sharing a study done by a consultant in terms of the issues in that area. And in the long run, medium, long-term solution, there may be a, pos a possible a recommendation to come up with a framework, but the framework was not even there at that point in time. So even the, the title can actually affect your, your consultation per session per se. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is something else that's also very important when you undertake public consultation, and this is a set spectrum of uh, public consultation. I'm using the one developed by IAP2, International Association of Public Participation. And uh, you know you can go to their website, you can Google it, you can get it, and it comes up with a, a range in terms of the the five different levels of uh, participation. I think at the end of the day, it's important to cl clarify the role of stakeholders in the process and how much influence they have in the decision making. So you know, as I mentioned earlier, you want to avoid uh, you want to avoid the engagement fatigue or the distrust due to not managing expectations. When you talk to someone. You want to make sure you know they know what information you want and and what level of information you expect from them so if you see here there are five levels that's inform consult involve collaborate and empower and each level would have a different goal you know as you can see below a goal a promise and actually something that i've taken up would have a different technique but we will talk about the techniques later so for the first one uh, this is where i said engagement or consultation may not necessarily be two-way if your engagement level is only informing, it's one way, you know, like this webinar, I'm just telling you, I, you're not telling me, you know, so it's just purely, you know, one way, me telling you, that's a one way. If you are at a consult level, that's where you will actually start to, you know, want to obtain feedback and analysis on issues, you know, and, and some um, methods that have been used to consult is focus group survey, surveys, so we get information from, from you, but you know, we may not necessarily use it. So, you know, it's, that's, that's another level. And then we have the uh, involved level, which is actually more closer towards, you know, working together. As you can see, involved and collaboration are both actually very close to working together, but collaboration actually gives them the decision-making power. For example, you co-decide, you know, for example, a technique for collaborate could be a technical working group between uh, industry and regulator. Whereas for involved, it could still be 
at a very low level of workshop, yes, you know, we're still designing solutions together, but doesn't necessarily mean I will take into account what you're saying. So that those are the different degrees. And lastly, is empower. Empower is, look, I can um, basically give you or give the stakeholders the power to decide. I'm not going to decide. I put it in your hand. You know, for example, um, juries, or if we talk about ballots, you know, referendums, you know, Brexit, you know, in the UK, that the society let people decide if they want to leave the UK. So leave the power or the decision making in the hands of the public. So that is just the spectrum. But I think it's very important when you want to engage, you need to decide firstly, as with anything, what is the level of engagement because you need to manage the stakeholders' ex expectation and not deliver false promises. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, how is public consultation conducted in Malaysia? So um, if you look at the guideline, there's a very long list. I'm sure you can Google it also. How do you how do you do public consultation? There's so many methods. So I thought I would give this a, a very Malaysian feel um, uh, in terms of the items that I talk about. So the first one is, of course, a physical meetings. Uh, that's very important. You know, one-to-one -one engagement builds trust. You can see the person. You can speak to the person. And, you know, just by the person visiting you, 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 you know, you can feel the closeness and, and, and also the trust when you are actually engaging them. So that's, that's obviously very good, but, you know, it's difficult. You don't have the time, you don't have the resources, yeah, you can't be everywhere at one time. But, you know, you usually want to have as many meetings as you can, if possible. And the second one is, okay, I didn't even bother to translate it because I know everyone here and, you know, I don't know how many of you are on this call right now, but if we talk about the most uh, common technique in Malaysia, that would be Benkil. Um, and in, you know, if we translate it to English, of course, that's workshop. So, so Benkil, I think in, in Malaysia, everyone knows Benkil. Lah. If there's, if there's an issue, let's go Benkil, let's go Benkil. And, um, you know, some observations in terms of this Benkil is, you know, usually used in small group, but in Malaysia, if it's a workshop, focus group, strategic session, anything that's a small meeting is kita akan Benkil, lah. kita akan Benkil. Secondly, I don't know why Benkil is always very far. Um, your stakeholders are in Cyberjaya, KL, but you have the Benkil in Langkawi, for example. So, you know, I mean, this is a common theme in Malaysia. And thirdly is that Benkils always run over the weekend. And, you know, so these are things that, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong, but these are the, some of the features that we have from our Malaysian context. Um, the next one we also have is town halls. I think town halls are, are very important also, and also very popular. Um, Companies always use town halls to address their their whole uh, entire staff. You know, they 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 use it to speak basically to a loud audience. Um, I've seen a, a minister do a town hall session, which I thought would be or could be very disastrous. But I was quite surprised that the uh, consultation uh, planner actually did a good job to develop controls to make sure that you know the 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 session or the speaker was well protected, the questions were well asked, you know, there were certain things to make sure that they got the information that they wanted. So I was quite surprised that they actually, they actually did that for a particular session. And then um, on the emails, I think, uh, of course, emails is very popular. Um, and this has been, you know, replacing conventional written communications. I'm sure, you know, when you engage with regulators, policy makers, the, the phrase bully email je, email uh, papa email je lah, is you know very common but more often than it not they're not you don't get any response um you know so um people usually use email as a follow-up I, I would think that you would engage them physically or through other means and then you get uh, email feedback uh, later on okay next slide now, I think it's also, I, I also broke it down. I mean, the first one was from a Malaysian perspective. Uh, the second one was from a, techno, the, this one right now is from a technology perspective. And I think this is important, you know, because given the COVID-19 pandemic situation we're in, people can't go out, social distancing, we're not going to get a cure probably until next year. So online virtual tools will be very popular. Um, I think they've been around for quite some time. If I can just run through the, the first three very quickly, virtual meetings, webinars, online surveys. I'm sure the last few weeks, uh, all of you have been going through online meetings, have been going through online webinars, you know, and then if you want information from a large group, you can quickly do online surveys. So basically these digital tools are already there for us to use. 
it's just a matter of us adopting, but we also have to ensure that it commensurates with the objective of the engagement when we want to engage with people. Now, I so this is a, a promotion for Vimala. I think I don't know if you want to talk about it later, but UPC, as I mentioned earlier, was developed by you know World Bank and MPC, and it provides this unified public, uh, a unified platform for regulators to use. So you know the the thing of the past where you know I had to go to a particular ministry's website. And then I would see a oh, website down or you know, or whatever they can't handle the bandwidth. That won't happen anymore because we have UPC. This is centralized. All Malaysian uh, regulators can go there. They can upload their documents. There's very, many techniques and tools that they can use and everything is transparent there. So the regulators can take charge, the public can access it, access it and we can get that information. So I think uh, the UPC is a, a step in the right direction and that's uh, something that is readily available right now. Sometimes I even go there and I find a lot of um, interesting legislation that's being uh, proposed. I see a space bill and whatnot. So it's good to go there from time to time if you are you know, interested in policy development or, or lawmaking. Uh, next slides, please. Next slide, Nancy. Okay. Now, uh, okay, this is the last slide I have before we go to the recap and summary. Now, this is essentially on selecting the right methods. As I mentioned earlier, you can see there are the five levels of inform, consult, involve, collaborate, and empower on the left. And um, you, you need to know, um, firstly, that this is not uh, exact science, you know. Um, the first thing that you need to consider is, of course, your engagement level needs to uh, commensurate with the techniques. But when I say it's not an exact science, it doesn't mean that if you use, uh, you know, a focus group for involved level or for collaborate level, it's wrong because you can always tweak and adapt, modify accordingly to use it for the different levels that you want. Um, there are also a lot of external factors, as you can see in the table on the far right. So um, one of the things that you, you need to consider is cost of funding because you may not have the, the money or the resources to do an extensive stakeholder engagement. You may want to, you know, it may be a good idea, you may plan the best, but you just don't have the money, okay? Uh, resources, I mean, when I say resources, I mean manpower, you may not have the people, you know, you want to do engagement throughout the whole of Malaysia, you want to go everywhere, you just can't. It's just too, too much, you just don't have the people, and, you know, you can't do it. And, and lastly, it's time. Um, you know, as with everything, uh, in, in, and everyone in the government tells me this, everything is due yesterday. Lah. So, you know, if you, you don't have the time, you need the answer now, you, you can't do the extensive stakeholder engagement. And, and lastly, one thing that I think a lot of people also overlook is culture. And, this, and culture covers a, a lot of things. Um, it's, for example, how do you identify the loud voice in the room? You know, when you engage someone, uh, when you engage a group of persons, then there's someone who's dominating the conversation and you can't get um, you know, input from everyone else because they're just herding behind this particular per person. Or, or what is society's um, preference in terms of giving a written response? I think I can see you there, Vimala, but um, you would know also, you can share that people in our culture don't like to write. They like to tell us, but there's some aversion of fear that if you write, you are wrong. Or, you know, you're saying the wrong thing. Only a few people dare do it, but, you know, they, they like to be cyber warriors. But when, they, when it comes to writing something official, they don't dare do it. And, and on top of that is how do you even present yourself when, when you engage? So there are so many external factors. When, when I say present yourself, I've, I've been to a um, consultation session where um, I was a consultant. We were, we were consulting with a GLC. Um, this large GLC was very averse did not want to see us for a very long time. Eventually they did. And the meeting was quite hostile for the for the first 10 minutes. And you know, after we managed to, to break the ice and you know, we told them we want to basically get these industry issues because we want to propose recommendations or improvements in the industry. They told as they warmed up to us, they told us, Oh, actually, your kita tak friendly dengan you sebab kita nampak you lawyer. Kita ingat you nak sama kita. So so the fact that we presented ourselves as being lawyers conducting the interview, they thought that we were actually gathering information against them, but not for them. So even things like that can actually affect um, your, your engagement session and your engagement style because it's, it's quite important that if you, if you don't think of these things, like I mentioned earlier, how do you present the topic? If you don't think of these things, you may not get the information that you want. So the, the last category that I, I put up there for you to vote on is 
is how do you select the right uh, method? You know, there's so many, like I said earlier, you can go online, there's a bucket list. I don't even know, I've not even used, you know, maybe 70% of these things. And how do you know, you know, how do you know what are the, the right consultation methods? So, so I put it up there. Um, there are many other conceptual ones. If you're interested, please vote in this area and then we can also, you know, go into a bit more de detail on this next week. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is my last slide. Okay, time is quite good. We can go for some Q&A. Um, let me just wrap it up re really quickly. So to recap, what are the lessons learned from our session on the five W's and the one H? So the, the you know, introduction to public consultation. Basically, it's all inside this, uh, uh, this teaser or invite for next week. This is what I want to teach you. The message is all here. So what is public consultation? The act of consulting in the decision-making process so if you look at this teaser, I am seeking your views to get input for my session next week. So I'm giving you guys, you know, the power, the chance to tell me what you want to hear. Why consult? So I'm making it clear in my promise to you that I'm managing your expectation. I'm empowering you to decide. So I said very clearly, highest vote wins. Although I may not show the results, but you trust me, the highest votes win. And um, who is involved? As you can see in yellow, quite big at the top, you. You are the ones who decide. I, I've made that quite you know, clear as well. When uh, I'm giving you two days, although some people may ask two days over a weekend may not be good uh, sufficient time, but you have to, two full days to decide by, by Monday morning to tell me what topics or what areas you want me to, to explore and how you can actually you know, scan this Slido code. Uh, I've tried it, it goes to the link. It, it has the, I think four or five pre-selected subtopics. There's also a category for other, so if there's something else that you you know think that is important or you want me to talk about in relation to consultation, I can consider that as well. Or if you want Bimala to speak next week, also you can put it there. Um, but you know, go in and, and please vote on that. So before I just I, I end, I, I like this cartoon very much. I, I was thinking of where to put it in my site. I you know, so I just I just put it at the end. Like, I think it just recaps what I want to say, you know. And and what it is is there's two people here, they're talking about something. And they're both right, you know, one person says it's a six, one person says it's a nine. Um, and this just underlines the, the fundamental importance of public consultation because you are both right, you know, or you or two, three people, you know, a number of people can be right. It's whatever they see from their perspective, you know. And if you want to design a, a solution, you need the best information, you need the best options, and, and you need to get that information before you can come up with a holistic solution. So if you don't consult, you may not get that perspective. Um, that's all I have for today. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, thank you for listening. I uh, Vimala for you know for the questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Izahar, for your very informative uh, presentation. So I think quickly we can go for the Q and A session. Uh, we have a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I will pick up a few. Uh. So uh, we have a question from Norzia. Kabil, okay. She has three questions here. She sent three questions. Okay, the first one, it is possible for us to use behavioral insight, BI approach in doing public consultation. Uh, is that the question? Yeah. That is the yeah, question. Can you can you read the three? Uh, can you read the three? Okay, it is possible for us to use BI uh, behavioral insight approach in doing public consultation. Yes, I, I yes. think yes. I think that's very good um, using behavioral insight. That's something that I also just recently learned through MPC. The, the problem is uh, with, you know, with us uh, Malaysians, I think we're not equipped with the tools. Um, I'm, I'm just going to generalize on when I say that. Um, for example, when we talk about RIA, we have CBA, we have consultation, we have all the piecemeal tools, but people still, you know, do it ad hoc, sporadic. People don't really know. So if if, if it's like only me and you know what is BI, other people may not. And secondly, knowing BI is, is one thing, but practicing or applying BI is another thing. BI is, is fantastic. You know, I always think about how they come up with all this. It's always coming up with sort of tweaks or modification, modification, subtle tweaks, subtle modification that can give you that intended outcome without coming up with any regulations or legal developments. I like that. But I think we, we don't have the tools or we don't have the experts to do that right now. That's what I think. All right. Okay, uh, another question from uh, Ms. Nurzia Kabil. 
If you may suggest what type of public consultation is suitable and effective in the context of Malaysia as a whole? What? Sorry, the first part? What type of public consultation is suitable and effective in the context of Malaysia as a whole? What type okay, of public so consultation? As I mentioned, thank, thank you, Vimala. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's no, I think there's no one tool that we can use to, you know, define all public consultation methods, even the um, the public consultation handbook, the one developed by MPC actually says, we encourage online public consultation, but it's not suitable in all situations. So you cannot say, for example, you want to engage uh, Orang Asli in Sarawak and you go put it online on the ministry's website, because you know these people don't have access to internet you know so we are moving towards digitalization people saying that's important but i don't think i can give you an answer to say that this applies across the board you need to look at you know there's a lot of criteria a lot of factors to consider who you are engaging you know um what level are you engaging them you know those are the things that and and what you expect from them so once you have these these answers only then can you decide what is the right way to engage them so i don't think we can say use online is the best or you know just do physical meetings Physi physical meetings is of course the safest but as we know now we are in covid 19 pandemic situation and when will we get the cure are we are we allowed or you know i think we are going to be practicing social distancing for a while okay uh, there is another question in current situation where physical meetings are prohibited how to conduct effective public consultation so this one maybe i can share that Unified public consultation is one of the platform. Uh, even uh, we have uh, many consultation document during this uh, COVID-19. Uh, during the MCO, there are many consultation document was uploaded in a uh, UPC. Actually, there is uh, one of the best platform at the moment that the regulators can use to do the consultation. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, there is another question. Is public consultation mm -hmm. required for the regulation passed during the time of emergency? Okay, um, well, if you look at it from a, a RIA perspective, RIA gives you exemptions. Lakan. So RIA says that if, if it's during emergency or crisis or if there is a need to pass regulation or legislation quickly you don't have to you can dispense with some of the requirements but later on you would uh, you know need to do a post implementation review one or two years later to review the effectiveness and to review whether the legislation achieves its intended outcomes but i believe that even even in a time of emergency and i think i, I listened a bit into the session by um the speaker from Singapore last week, he said he used the word there was no formal consultation process, but he also did share there was a committee. So, you know, even even through that committee, businesses, industries, associations, and so on would be represented, you know, and, and they, they would have engaged through there, you know, even, you know, as we, we have various platforms, various channels to obtain feedback, I'm sure there, there are a lot of ways and means to do it. It may not be formal, like he said, but you know, it still can be done. There's still ways, and there is a necessity to do it. Like, I think because I, I'm, I'm, I'm averse to creating regulation if the regulation is not going to achieve what we want to achieve. So if we come up with some regulation, or if we don't need, perhaps I mean, MPC is really strong in this area, which is deregulation. If we don't need the regulation, if there are existing mechanisms and institutions, for example, the previous question on behavioral insights, we should we should take that step. We should follow that step. Okay. Um, okay. Another question from Muama Aizuddin Nurazman. According to RIA, uh, regulatory impact analysis, public consultation is considered at fifth element. Do you concur that regulators should conduct public consultation throughout RIA process, especially at the stage of problem statement, so that the regulator can pinpoint the correct problem? Thank you. Thank you, Vimala. Uh, I agree with uh, Aizuddin, actually. I think um, the the conversation in relation to consultation is always continuing. It doesn't stop, uh, you know, it, it starts throughout the whole process and even goes on after. I think I shared a slide on this earlier and I said you have pre, you have formal, you have post 
and then you know when you go on later on you want to do a review of your legislation you want to improve your legislation you still need to talk to the stakeholder so i think that the, the, con the conversation is continuing as 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 you know in the the rule making or law making process before you even want to create regulation or leg legislation you know you need to come up with the issue paper you need to you need to develop what is the fundamental issue and what is the fundamental problem regulators are you know in the sky they are not on the ground so the people on the ground they know they are the ones facing the the issues they are the ones burdened by regulations they are the ones affected by the regulations so they would know what are the industry issues so that's why you need to continuously talk to them throughout okay uh, maybe this is the last question uh, mr Aza, because you're ready for four o'clock now so how to measure the okay. success of public consultation success of public oh, that's, consultation that's a, good, that's a very good question i think there's no uh, easy answer to that um the only way that you can really measure that is that whether your your solution uh, at the end of the day achieves um the objective that you want because as you know when we come up with okay we are consulting we are consulting someone because we want inputs or we want ideas in designing the solution and when we come up with the solution the solution itself it could be a law it could be it could be behavioral insights it could be conduct you know it could be curbing conduct telling someone not to do something that uh that design or that or that or that solution would only um determine the outcome you know so we we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to actually spell out look we're going to make sure we're going to save so many lives you know we can't we can't say that so if the end result or the end uh, solution achieves that outcome, then I would say that, you know, the consultation has been successful. Of course, you can't make everyone happy, lah, you know, throughout the consultation process, there will be people who are unhappy. But if you can achieve that, that outcome that you intended, then that is the barometer of success for me. Lah. All right. So okay. once again, thank you, Mr. Izaha, for the presentation and feedback for the question shared by the audience. Uh, perhaps we can go. I would like to take this opportunity to share our upcoming event for next week. Huh? Uh, can we show on the poster brochure? All right. So uh, we have a virtual advisory clinic for RIA regulatory impact analysis, whereby the audience, if they want to know more on the RIA, also uh, on a public consultation or unified public consultation. Uh, they may contact us through uh, email uh, at regulatory review at mpc.gov.my. Okay, so the next uh, we're going to have a webinar series uh, pro business regulation with the topic reimagining patents act 1983 act 291 towards sustainable support of innovation on 12 May. We have a two uh, wonderful speaker who are going to speak on this topic next week. So I hope everyone can join uh, to this session. And the next one, we're going to have our understanding public consultation in Malaysia part two. As our uh, Mr. Izah said just now, we leave it to our participant to vote, okay, to choose uh, the topic that they would like us to share next week, okay. To do that, they need to uh, scan the QR code and choose the topic by uh, the deadline by Monday. Uh, all right, so we're already at the end of the session. So for for all information, today's webinar session has been recorded and it will be uploaded in the website, uh, MPC website within the next few days. And also the survey form will be provided at the end of the session and appreciate all the participants could complete it for our further improvement. So thank you to everyone and uh, be safe and stay productive. See you till next week.